Today's episode contains a brief mention of violence against women. So if you are sensitive to this subject, please listen at your own discretion. What is art without the muse? Many of Western art's most famous works are depictions of women. But who were these women? Do they have their own stories to share with the world? Hello and welcome to Art Muse, a podcast that aims to reshape the ways in which we interpret well-known works of art by paying dues to the women whose images have been immortalized, but whose names and stories have been wrongfully overlooked. While these women's faces are familiar to viewers around the world, their identities have been largely forgotten. Together we will explore the important lives and legacy of the female muse and appreciate these works of art from a new perspective, through the eyes of the women whose image stares back at us. Is the muse in actuality just as, if not more, important than the artists themselves? And I'm your host, Grace Anna. In 2008, Lucian Freud's Benefits Supervisor Sleeping broke a world record for the most expensive painting sold by a living artist auctioned off at the staggering price of $33.6 million. While this sale turned Freud into a household name and continued to raise the value of his works to sky-high prices, the woman featured in Freud's painting was left with nothing, not even an invite to attend the record-breaking sale of her portrait. Although her forceful presence is the driving force behind the work's status as masterpiece, Freud's model has been unjustly overlooked and underappreciated as an integral part of what makes Benefits Supervisor Sleeping so remarkable. In today's episode, I share with you the story of Sue Tilly, the Benefits Supervisor fast asleep in Freud's portrait, and give her her rightful dues in our appreciation of Freud's famed work. Sue can be found in four of Freud's paintings, as a sleeping goddess whose dreams we are left to imagine. All four of these works are today owned by some of the most powerful men in the world. But Sue has lived a robust and adventure-filled life outside of her role as Lucian Freud's model and the work's subsequent record-breaking sales. Though a benefit supervisor by day, Sue was a club girl by night and could be found in London's most notorious nightclubs of the 1980s, alongside icons like Boy George. On the night Sue wasn't modeling for Freud, she was working the ticket booth at the infamous club Taboo, drinking the night away with friends until they could all barely stand. Sue felt most at home in these dark and dingy dance floors, where she could unapologetically be her authentic self. Sue developed a close relationship with the performance artist, Lee Bowery, whose forward-thinking, gender-bending, and provocative costumes and performances were at the heart of London's new romantic movement. Sue was also at Lee's side when he tragically passed away of AIDS in the early 90s, the only friend that Lee told he was sick. Sue has since written the most extensive biography of Lee Bowery's life to ever be published. And through it all, Sue held her job as benefits supervisor at the Job Center, where she worked for over 30 years. Today, Sue enjoys retirement on the English coast in an artistic community in Hastings, where she makes her own art and continues to pose for various artists. Despite her serious facade and Freud's portraits of her, Sue has a uniquely humorous and warm spirit that brightens the lives of those around her. The time is far overdue for Sue's riveting life story to be shared, and for us to be lucky enough to experience a small fraction of the magic that is Sue Tilly. Without further ado, let's dive in. Susan Caroline Tilly was born on March 7, 1957, in London. Her parents had met at their local church youth group and lived just down the road from each other. 
Sue's father was only 20 years old when he married Sue's mother, and Sue was soon after conceived on their honeymoon. Because Sue's father worked at a bank, he was able to afford a spacious apartment in Paddington that housed not only Sue and her parents, but also her aunt, uncle, and cousins, who quickly became Sue's closest childhood companions. Sue enjoyed a happy childhood and loving upbringing. During her early years in London, Sue spent a lot of her time at museums, especially enjoying the Science Museum. She had dreams of becoming a fashion designer and was always busy making drawings. When her younger sister was born, Sue would often ask her mom to judge drawing competitions between them, which Sue always won, having the upper hand of being four years older. Paddington at the time was rough, and Sue and her family lived on a particularly rough road. Sue would watch from her window as prostitutes and heavily intoxicated people were carted off in police vans. While her parents were mortified, young Sue was fascinated by their outfits and provocative behavior. Though her parents decided to move the family to Surrey when Sue was six, she made a promise with herself to return to London as soon as she could. When Sue turned 11, her family moved once again, this time north to Harpenton. That same year, Sue went on a school trip to the Netherlands, leaving England for the first time. Sue became enamored with Amsterdam and was deeply captivated by the Rijksmuseum. She fell particularly in love with the artist Rembrandt, standing in front of his The Night Watch in awe. Sue bought a book on Rembrandt from the gift shop, a book she would read cover to cover many times in her life. Had she known at the time that her own image would one day be in art books, she would have never have believed it. Sue's parents remained religious through her adolescence. Sue was required to attend church each week, which she became increasingly resentful of. By the time Sue hit her teenage years, she discovered her love of boys and mischief. Girls just want to have fun, and Sue was certainly no exception. At the age of 18, Sue attended Wall Hall College to train to be an art school teacher. University was the perfect opportunity for Sue to be away from her church-going parents and let out her wild side. Though always a lover of the arts, Sue wasn't very focused on her studies and barely scraped by. While Sue found most of her classmates dull and boring, she did enter her first and only proper romantic relationship in her life. Sue and her boyfriend were engaged to be engaged, and he would frequently ask Sue's mother for Sue's hand in marriage. But in her heart, Sue knew that the married life was not for her. She would stand behind her boyfriend's back and plead with her mom to decline her boyfriend's request. As Sue later reflected, I think deep down, I knew I wasn't really normal. I didn't want to get married and have children. You know how people say, oh, my clock's ticking, gotta have some children. Well, my clock never really wound up. Had Sue pursued a career as an art teacher or married her college sweetheart, her life would have been vastly different. And the world today would be short Freud's masterful portraits of Sue Lucky for us, Sue had other plans. In her own words, I left and went to London, and my whole life went how I wanted it to. After university, Sue moved in with a friend and went to look for a job at a job center. As fate would have it, Sue needn't look far, as the job center ended up offering her a job there instead. Sue would end up working this job for the next 30 plus years. Though it wasn't the most interesting or glamorous of jobs, Sue appreciated the steady income, and she would more than make up for it with her wild and fun-filled social life. When her roommate passed up on a room in a squat house in Kentish Town, 
Sue happily took her spot. She applied for a promotion and requested to transfer to the job center in Camden Town. At 22 years old, Sue had found herself in the heart of London's burgeoning social scene. Walking around Camden Town, Sue could barely believe her eyes. The streets were filled with grungy and rebellious youths, openly doing drugs and wearing eye-catching outfits. On more than one occasion, Sue spotted a pop star walking past her office window on Denmark Street. It didn't take long for a new friend to invite Sue to the nightclubs. Dancing across the sticky floors of these clubs, Sue felt, for maybe the first time in her life, that she could be whoever she wanted to be. And she knew she had found her community. And her community in the squat house in Kentish Town strengthened as well. Sue, who friends affectionately nicknamed Big Sue, would host huge parties with her housemates, sometimes two weekends in a row, before they could even clear the remnants of the first one. Eager partygoers would line up down the street to join in on the drinking, dancing, and all sorts of mischievous behavior that took place. These parties acted as a gathering point for friends to get ready to go out to the clubs together, and they were often Sue's favorite part of the night. London's club scene of the 1980s was a unique world, existing for a fleeting period of time in the years prior to the devastating AIDS epidemic. It was in these clubs that the new romantic movement was born, defined by its flamboyant fashion, avant-garde music and performances, and eccentric nightclubs like Blitz and Kinky Gerlinky, where all sorts of debauchous behavior went down. To combat London's dreary weather, London's youth created colorful and glitzy outfits with what little they could afford. The nightclubs were not only a place to dance the night away and for alternative musicians to perform, but for everyone to showcase the outfits that they had created for the night. Sue herself remembers flaunting a dress she knit out of a tablecloth on one occasion. These clubs were frequented by some of the biggest pop stars of the time, like Boy George and Mick Jagger. Genders and sexualities were blurred, and all were welcome to play. Though herself heterosexual, Sue felt a sense of belonging amongst the queer community. She absolutely loved going out, catching glimpses of celebrities, and drinking the night away, famously saying, Unless I'm falling over, it's not a good night out. And soon, Sue would meet the person that would forever change her life, in more ways than one can count. And we owe the existence of Sue's portraits to this fateful encounter. In 1982, while Sue was out at a club called Heaven, she was introduced to Lee Bowery, a handsome Australian man four years Sue's younger. Lee immediately caught Sue's attention, and as they began to introduce themselves to each other, she felt an instant connection. Sue was warmed by Lee's jolly face, and they found they had much in common, including both coming from a strictly religious household. But what sealed the deal was when Sue and Lee went to another club later in the night. Sue began rolling around the floor and kissing a man who she convinced everyone was her brother. Of course, that man was certainly not Sue's brother, but her shocking and humorous act impressed Lee, who had his own talent for mischievous behavior. It didn't take long for Sue and Lee to become fast friends and nearly inseparable. It was with Sue by his side that Lee began his career as a performance artist. In many ways, Lee turned his own body into art through outlandish and often nightmarish costuming and contortions of his body. Garbed head to toe, Lee was a different persona every evening and continuously pushed social boundaries through brilliantly shocking acts. In one such act, Lee stuffed his assistant Nicola under his costume and gave birth to her on stage. 
Though Sue herself wouldn't always partake in these provocative performances, she thought they were marvelous, and it was immensely exciting for her to see her best friend become a social sensation. A rising star, Lee decided to open his own nightclub, the now legendary Taboo. Taboo was a hedonistic paradise where polysexuality was encouraged and avant-garde costumes were the norm. The dance floor was always pure mayhem, with people falling over each other, both drunk and alive. Celebrities like George Michael and Mick Jagger were frequent attendees. And at the center of it all was Lee, a shining star amidst a dark club sky, spinning around those lucky enough to grab his attention on the dance floor. And behind the ticket counter was Sue. It was Sue who sold tickets to eager socialites, often dictating the price on the spot, depending on how much Sue liked them. She was also in charge of typing out the guest list, which she would do from her office. Always one for a prank, Sue would put celebrity names on the list to psych out the bouncers as a joke. But more than anything else, Taboo was a safe haven for Sue, Lee, and their friends to explore themselves and to be as extravagant, outlandish, and provocative as their hearts desired. With Taboo, Lee became a phenomenon. Magazines started to feature him on their cover. He was interviewed on television, and London's underground social scene couldn't get enough of him. And Sue was along for the ride. When Lee was invited to New York to put on a fashion show at the infamous club Limelight, Sue was thrilled to be able to join. One of Sue's biggest dreams in life was to visit New York City, and it was finally coming true. Along with some friends, she boarded the flight to New York with a large bottle of vodka from Duty Free. Taking any opportunity to party, they drank vodka and smoked cigarettes the whole way there. Among her posse was the fashion designer, Judy Blaine. When Sue finally arrived in New York City, she couldn't believe her eyes. There were manhole covers with thick steam filling the air and subway ads about cockroaches. She loved every minute of it. After a few days of jet lag, Sue and Lee partied the night away at both Limelight and Area, where they enjoyed magic mushrooms and went to sex clubs in the meatpacking district. New York was everything Sue had hoped it be. She met fabulous people, experienced the craziest clubs in the city, and formed unforgettable memories with friends. While Sue made her way into the heart of London's underground social scene, she maintained her role as the benefits supervisor at the job center. Head pounding with a hangover from the night before, Sue never missed a day of work, never even taking sick days. In many ways, Sue lived a double life, but her day job and nightlife did get some crossover. Friends from the clubs would stop by at her office and ask Sue to help them find work, and colleagues at work would turn to Sue to show them a good time at the clubs. Sue had her foot in both the administrative world and the wild and naughty world of London's nightlife, and soon she would have her foot in the art world as well. Lee not only took Sue along his wild ride through London's club scene, but he was also the one to first introduce her to Lucian Freud. Lee met Freud at a nightclub and soon after began modeling for him. Though Lee was known for his extravagant outfits, Freud painted Lee fully in the nude. In this way, Freud's portraits of Lee present a vulnerability that we can imagine Lee normally hid behind the many layers of his costumes. Also hidden was the fact that Lee had AIDS all whilst modeling for Freud, a diagnosis that only Sue knew about, which gives his portraits an almost haunting presence today. But more on that soon. 
Lee, wanting Sue to leave her office day job, was behind the ploy to have Sue model for Lucian Freud. Though it was Lee's initiative, he knew for his plan to work, he had to let Freud think it was his own idea to paint Sue. Sue first met Freud briefly at a nightclub, but it was during a lunch with Freud, Lee, Sue, and a few others that Freud had the thought to paint Sue. As Sue ate her meal, she noticed Freud's bulging eyes looking her up and down, and she knew that Lee's secret plan had worked. Sue had passed the painter's test. The first painting we find Sue in is Evening in the Studio. Painted in 1993, a naked Sue is sprawled across the wooden floor, seemingly asleep. Behind Sue is a seated woman knitting, and to her right, a dog snuggled up in bed. The woman seated behind Sue is Nicola, Lee's assistant and eventually wife. Lee himself was originally in the composition, lying across the bed, but was offered a role in a play in Scotland, so Freud replaced Lee with his own dog. The painting has an eerie air, and we aren't sure if we are looking at a scene from a studio or a crime scene. Is Sue just sleeping? Or are we witness to something much more nefarious? Sue posed for Freud every evening from 7 p.m. to 1 a.m., still expected at work the next morning. And on the night Sue wasn't posing for Freud, she continued to work the ticket counter at Taboo and partied the night away with friends. Posing on the floor for hours on end was extremely uncomfortable, and Sue almost quit just after two days. It took a great amount of self-motivation for her to continue, muttering under her breath in moments of doubt, you can do this. Fortunately, Evening in the Studio is the only painting in which we find Sue on the floor. She would soon be united with her famous counterpart, the antique couch that we find her snoozing upon, like a sleeping goddess in the next works she posed for. We find Sue again in Benefit Supervisor Resting, painted the following year. Seated in the nude at the corner of an antique couch, Sue lulls her head back in a moment of deep relaxation. Has she fallen asleep? Or is she simply just indulging in a moment of leisure? The painting captures a private moment between Sue and herself. A deep sigh, a roll of the head, and the enjoyment of her own body. She is both Sue and a resting goddess, caught in the act of falling asleep. It is quite amusing to consider, as we stare at the tranquil figure before us, that Sue may have been thinking about the mischievous antics she was up to at her favorite clubs the night before, and smirking to herself in secrecy. Sadly, this wouldn't be the only secret Sue would soon have to keep. Around the time that Sue began modeling for Lucian Freud, Lee asked her to come over to her house to talk. When Sue arrived, Lee showed her a letter from the hospital, confirming that he had tested positive for AIDS. He had actually been diagnosed two years prior when he initially tested, but hadn't seen the results until now. Lee had had AIDS for two years without knowing, luckily not showing any signs of illness. Sue and Lee held each other tightly as they cried into each other's arms, not knowing what they would do if Lee got sick. London's once lively and carefree club scene was now filled with an atmosphere of fear. The government began slipping notices under people's doors with warnings about AIDS, and everyone grew paranoid of contracting it. One by one, Sue began to lose her friends to the virus. It was hard to believe that people so full of life could be gone with the blink of an eye. She witnessed her roommate, a member of a colorful pop band, get terribly sick and pass away soon after. Sue was the one who had to share the heartbreaking news with his parents. At his funeral, Lee stood by her side, hand in hand, 
the secret of Lee's own diagnosis hanging over their heads. And Sue feared for her best friend's life. Lee didn't exhibit any symptoms for a while, and he and Sue started to believe that Lee would be spared. Sue remained the only person that Lee had told about his diagnosis, a secret she safeguarded at all costs. Tragically, the virus silently worked its way through Lee's body until he was hit with a sudden onset of symptoms. It soon became clear that Lee would need to be hospitalized. It was Sue who brought Lee to the hospital, hand in hand, and she would remain by his side through the seven remaining weeks of Lee's life. The hospital was a horrifying scene. Doctors, unsure of how AIDS spread or how to treat it properly, sectioned off patients with the virus. The air smelled of fear and death, and Sue and Lee spent each day lying in Lee's hospital bed together, shaking. But Sue and Lee tried their best to fight through the fear with humor. Despite Lee's progressing illness, the pair cracked morbid jokes to each other into the wee hours of the night. When it became clear that Lee was not going to get better, Sue encouraged him to tell his father and sister. Lee's family was still recovering from the death of his mother just a few months prior, and now would have to face the end of Lee's life as well. Lee was grateful that his mother wasn't alive to see his own death, and the prospect of her waiting for him on the other side must have been of comfort. Lee's father and sister arrived in London for Christmas. Though Lee was in the hospital, he was never one to get in the way of a good time. So Sue settled them in a hotel and organized a Christmas dinner that they could enjoy. Lee was able to see his father and sister in the last week of his life. On New Year's Eve, 1994, Sue left the hospital to get some sleep. At 3 a.m., she received a call that Lee Bowery, her dearest friend, had died. It felt appropriate that Lee had passed away on New Year's Eve, a final dramatic act by the man who enjoyed nothing more than making a bold statement. Had Lee lived another six months, he may have been able to receive treatment, developed shortly after his death. Sue would always cherish her years with Lee Bowery, the most extraordinary person she had ever known. He had changed her life, and so many of the lives around her, with his uniquely generous spirit. He was kind, funny, bold, and simply fabulous, and he would forever live on in Sue's heart. And Lee would also live on in the portraits of Sue that Freud painted after Lee's death. In the months following Lee's passing, Freud painted his most renowned portrait of Sue, the work that would one day break records for the most expensive painting ever sold, Benefit Supervisor Sleeping. Here we find a life-size Sue, fast asleep on the familiar green couch, face pressed against the couch's arm, and caressing her breast with one hand. Though asleep, she is quietly confident, comfortable in her own skin, and retains a tranquil yet powerful presence. We cannot help but wonder what the sleeping Sue is dreaming about as she sinks into the warm green couch. Might she be dreaming of her days gliding across the dance floor with her lost friend? the same friend who connected her with the painter now painting her portrait. Was she dreaming as she lay across the couch that she would wake to find Lee stroking her hair, garbed in one of his fabulous outfits? Resilient as she was, we can only imagine the subtle ways in which Sue's grief worked its way into her portrait, and that Lee's lingering presence can be felt in the empty space next to Sue. In 1996, Sue posed for her final portrait by Freud. Titled Sleeping by the Lion Carpet, we find Sue sleeping upright in a leather chair, her head nestled into her hand. 
Above Sue's head in the background are two lions, one female and one male, staring into the distance alertly. Are the lions a figment of Sue's imagination? Her dream world coming to life? Are they an allude to her friendship with Lee? Male and female lion playing amongst the vast landscape. Or are they part of the decor of this bizarre world that we find Sue sleeping in? Like a mythological deity with her fierce protectors, Sue is unbothered by their presence, tranquil and secure in her sleep. For these last three portraits, deemed daytime portraits, Sue would model for Freud every weekend from 7.30 a.m. to 3 p.m., arriving early enough to catch the first day's light. On a typical day, Sue and Freud would enjoy a quick breakfast and chat before Sue posed uninterrupted for 90 minutes. She would then be given a quick break to use the restroom and stretch her legs and modeled again straight until lunchtime. Freud would often cook Sue lunch, but sometimes he would take Sue out to a fancy restaurant, which she particularly enjoyed. After lunch, Sue would return to modeling until she was dismissed in the late afternoon. On top of the meals provided, Sue was paid a small fee of 33 pounds a day. Each painting took Freud approximately nine months to complete. The canvas faced Sue as Freud painted her, so she would watch as her portraits progressed. In time, she got used to Freud's frightening, bulging eyes, which seemed to try to take in as much of her body as possible as he painted her image. She also got accustomed to being naked in front of Freud, but she did still cover up when she walked around his house or went to the restroom. Sue would spend the hours posing, thinking without distraction. As Sue recalled, you don't often have the opportunity to do nothing and just think. I had nothing to do, and there's nothing I could do except think. But Sue wasn't just posed as a sleeping goddess. She would frequently fall asleep during her modeling sessions. Her dreams were often a bizarre blend of reality with fantasy. Sometimes she would dream that Freud had given her a break and wake up to stand up and stretch, startling the confused Freud. He would often consent and give her the break anyway. When Sue was awake, she enjoyed chatting with Freud, who had a particular liking for gossip. He would tell Sue of meeting celebrities, famously claiming that Judy Garland had a weak handshake, and of his early adventures gambling and womanizing. Over time, Sue and Freud developed a close friendship. While many people found Freud intimidating, Sue found him to be quite entertaining. He did, however, tell Sue some stories that horrified her, like making his dog lick all the fresh bread at the baker's, and more seriously, that he had once kicked a woman. What alarmed Sue the most was that Freud did not seem to find anything wrong with his behavior, happily sharing these anecdotes with her without remorse. Sue was grateful that she and Freud never developed any romantic feelings for one another, remaining strictly platonic, which allowed her to avoid Freud's more problematic behavior. At a distance, she found Freud's complicated personality fascinating, with the capacity to be both mean-spirited and extremely generous, grumpy and good-humored, quiet and gregarious. As Sue recalled, he was a special sort of person with a very changeable personality. It was wonderful to get to know a great artist so well. And Freud was equally interested in Sue. He even invited Sue's parents to his studio curious to meet the parents that had birthed his favorite model. Knowing Sue's father was a big sports fan, Freud purposefully would burst out random sports facts to impress her dad. Freud also introduced Sue to the other subjects of his paintings. Sue was thrilled to meet the faces in the paintings so familiar to her. 
Though the pay was low, Sue was grateful for the many exciting perks that came with modeling for Freud. As Sue herself said, I remember it all with great affection. I would be remiss if I did not discuss the importance of Sue's portraits as a challenge to the traditional female nude. Images of the reclining female nude reappear throughout the history of Western art, from antiquity through the Renaissance and modernity. These images by and large depict women with flawless bodies and unattainable beauty. Sue's portraits instead present a real woman, confident in her curves and voluptuousness. Though never Sue's intention, her portraits take on this outdated trope of the perfected female nude by unabashedly being herself, granting us the same permission to unapologetically be our own selves in return. As Sue remarked, I'm not the ideal woman. I know I'm not, but who is? But any challenge to the norm inevitably receives pushback, and Sue unfortunately learned this the hard way. When Evening in the Studio was first put on view at Whitechapel Gallery, Sue overheard a man giving a talk in front of the painting, calling her revolting. Always turning to humor in life's toughest moments, Sue began to laugh and told the man that it was her that he was talking about. The moment was not only deeply humiliating for the man criticizing Sue, but a formative moment in Sue's own detachment from public opinion. As Sue recalled, after that, I really didn't mind what people said. And though some were quick to criticize, her portraits have more importantly been a source of immense inspiration for women all around the world to accept their own bodies and to give as little thought to other people's opinion as Sue. When Sue finished modeling for Freud, a friend approached her about writing a biography of Lee Bowery's life which she happily accepted. There couldn't have been a better person than Sue to document Lee's life and to make sure his legacy was never forgotten. Over a period of four to five months, Sue spent her weekends conducting interviews with Lee's family and friends and piecing together a manuscript. All the while, Sue continued to work her day job at the job center. Her book, titled Lee Bowery, The Life and Times of an Icon, was published in 1997. To this day, it is the most extensive written record of Lee's life. It is also a brilliant record of London's club subculture of the 80s, the world in which she and Lee thrived. Sue found the experience of writing Lee's biography not only deeply enjoyable, but also deeply cathartic a conduit for her own processing of Lee's passing. All the while Sue finished Lee's biography and continued to live her life, working at the job center and always spending ample time with friends, she was too busy to realize that Lucian Freud had stopped speaking to her. It was Lee's assistant, Nicola, who informed her that Freud had cut ties with Sue, a decision that Sue was completely unaware of. Freud had taken offense at a remark Sue made on a podcast produced by the Tate, in which she joked that Freud must have enjoyed replacing Lee with his dog an evening in the studio because he didn't need to pay his dog. Though clearly made in jest, Freud found the comment unacceptable. And despite the years that Sue gave her time and energy towards Freud's work, he deemed the comment grounds to end their friendship. Sue believes that Freud purposefully took offense as an excuse to cut her out of his life, and that Freud tended to do this with people who were no longer a part of his day to day. Once they had satisfied his needs, these relationships posed as distractions that could interrupt Freud's work, and that he took any opportunity to limit his extraneous relationships. And Freud was clearly quite stubborn in his convictions. Not even the record-breaking sale of Sue's portrait, Benefit Supervisor Sleeping, would break Freud's vow of silence. In 2008, Benefit Supervisor Sleeping sold at Christie's for a record-breaking price of $33.6 million. 
The buyer was Roman Abramovic, a Russian oligarch and former owner of the English football team Chelsea. Though the sale upped the value of Freud's work to sky-high prices and turned him into a household name, Freud did not so much as call Sue to thank her for her instrumental role in his work, let alone send her a bouquet of flowers. The longer Sue waited by the phone for any gesture of appreciation, she realized that she would never hear from the artist she had dedicated years of her life to modeling for. Sadly, it wasn't just Freud who slighted Sue, but Christie's auction house as well. Sue had been notified by a journalist four months before the sale that her portrait was predicted to break a record at auction. Sue thought that she was being pranked, finding it hard to believe that her portrait could sell for millions of dollars. Christie's not only did not extend an invite to Sue to watch her portrait make history, they directly told Sue that she couldn't attend. At the time of the sale, Sue was still working at the job center. That day, she attended work as usual, nowhere near prepared for the mayhem that would ensue. Once the painting sold, Sue's phone immediately began ringing off the hook with requests for interviews, photos, and appearances. When she stopped responding, the press began camping outside her doorstep. The Sunday Mirror even offered her 500 pounds to strip naked, which Sue quickly declined. Christie's auction house called to check in on her, but when Sue pleaded for help navigating the swarm of requests and calls, they said that she was on her own. Sue would see Freud just one more time before he died in 2011. Shortly before his death, she heard a familiar voice at a party, beckoning her from behind. Susan, how are you? The voice asked. Sue turned around to see an aged Freud. They had a short and sweet conversation, and though their dispute and Freud's subsequent dismissal of Sue amidst the sale of benefit supervisor sleeping were not openly addressed, Sue felt a sense of resolution and closure as she looked into the painter's bulging eyes one last time. Thanks to Sue, Freud died holding the record for the most expensive painting ever sold at auction. Though Freud would not be alive to see it, his portrait of Sue titled Benefit Supervisor Resting would break even more records selling for the astonishing price of $56 million in 2015. And Sleeping by the Lion Carpet, Freud's last portrait of Sue, is now owned by the British businessman and owner of the English football team Tottenham, Joe Lewis. Some of the wealthiest and most powerful men in the entire world own these intimate images of Sue and have the ability to gaze upon her naked body whenever they please. If this isn't jarring enough, Sue speculates that these wealthy buyers have likely stashed her portraits away in storage, seeing them as financial commodities rather than art to be enjoyed in the everyday. This bleak reality is one of many reasons why Sue today is disheartened by the art world. The experience of having her portrait sell for millions of dollars, money she herself would never see, without so much as an invite to the event or an acknowledgement that it is an image of her body that is being sold, understandably left a sour taste in Sue's mouth. And sadly, Sue has continued to be snubbed by auction houses, museums, and galleries. When the Centre Pompidou opened an exhibition on Lucien Freud, Sue wasn't invited to the opening and had to call to see if she could even attend. In Sue's own words, I think models are treated like complete rubbish. The National Gallery recently had a big exhibition on Lucian, and they phoned up to do an interview, and then rang back and said, sorry, they don't want us to interview any of the models. And it's as if you don't matter. But Sue has decided to not hold on to any resentment. She values the experience of modeling for one of the greatest artists of our time over any monetary gain. As Sue has said, the main thing that I got to keep was the actual experience. How lucky I was to spend so much time with such a great and interesting painter. 
We have to commend Sue's positive attitude, a testament to her ability to practice gratitude even in the most challenging of situations, and to never let anything stop her from living her life to the fullest. And though Freud, the auction houses, and museums slighted Sue, the fame her portrait sales brought changed her life overnight and brought with it exciting opportunities. As Sue recalled, Since the day Benefit Supervisor Sleeping sold for that record amount, my life hasn't been the same. It wasn't exactly boring before, but it's gone up a couple of notches. Sue has been asked to give talks, meet with art students, and even was cast as an extra in a film starring Daniel Craig. She has carved her way into the fashion world, befriending fashion icons like Kate Moss and collaborating with Fendi, who in 2018 put out a collection of luxury clothing decorated with Sue's original drawings of household objects, like teacups and bananas. Sue, who as a girl had wanted to become a fashion designer, couldn't believe that her childhood dream had come true, with one of the top designers in the world nonetheless. And of course, since her portrait's record sales turned Sue into the world's most famous living model, other contemporary artists have clamored to have Sue sit for them too. She modeled for the English filmmaker Sam Taylor Johnson, whose photographs of Sue were nominated for the Turner Prize and exhibited at the Tate Britain, and the French photographer Jacques Bosset. Recently, she modeled for the Portuguese painter Rui Miguel Leitao Ferreira. Ferreira's portraits play off of Freud's portraits, except this time Sue is clothed and it is the artist who is nude. It was also Ferreira who encouraged Sue to start making her own art. Taking Sue under his wing, he encouraged her to start drawing and painting again. With Ferrara's encouragement, Sue rediscovered her love of making art and began honing in on improving her technique. Though she had trained to be an art teacher decades earlier, she finally fell into her own artistic practice much later in life. The model now had the paintbrush in her own hand, and she was ready for her big artistic break. Sue first exhibited her own work in 2015 at a gallery in East London, titled This Is My Life. The exhibition showcased original drawings and paintings with a cartoonish yet self-assured style. Sue has made several self-portraits, sometimes in the style of other famed artists like Matisse, Cezanne, and Frida Kahlo. In this way, she has also reclaimed her own image. In a nude self-portrait painted on a plate for charity titled, The Benefit Supervisor Has Woken Up, Sue depicts herself alert and in full control of her body. After over 30 years of dedicated work, Sue officially retired from her position as the benefit supervisor at the Job Center in 2017. The job that was not only forever immortalized in the titles of Freud's famed portraits, but that Sue had worked through the greatest roller coasters of her life was now behind her. Living off of her well-deserved pension, Sue can now focus on making art, modeling for other artists, and enjoying time with friends. Upon retirement, Sue moved from London to St. Leonard's-on-Sea in Hastings, a quirky artistic community on England's coast. Her decision to move to Hastings was made on a whim, but Sue was never one to hang on to the past and embraced the fresh start. She celebrated her 60th birthday shortly after settling in, and swam in the sea for the first time in her life. Thanks to her warm personality, she quickly made friends within the community, and soon, everyone knew Sue's name. Shortly after her move, Sue was diagnosed with breast cancer. Her diagnosis resulted in a single mastectomy. Sue's body, that had been immortalized in Freud's nude portraits of her, would be forever changed. 
Though Sue had a fear of cancer since she was a child, she surprised herself with her own resilience and strength. Always one to see the positives in even the grimmest of situations, Sue looked forward to stopping at the farm stand on her way to radiotherapy. She focused on settling into her new seaside apartment and made jokes about having her famous breasts pickled and sent to Damien Hurst as an art piece. But most of all, Sue made the intentional decision to enjoy her life and not spend her time worrying. Luckily, her doctors were able to eradicate the cancer and Sue has since lived cancer-free. Today, Sue enjoys a simple yet full life in Hastings. Friends, artists, and journalists from all over the world have visited Sue at her seaside home. Her home is decorated with her vibrant works of art and is as colorful as Sue's spirit itself. She runs community art classes, which she even offered virtually during the COVID-19 pandemic and she continues to make her own art, recently doing a series of pet portraits. As for Sue's legacy, Boy George released a musical about the world in which Sue and Lee Bowery thrived called Taboo, named after Lee's club. The musical debuted on Broadway in 2002, and one of the leading characters was based on Sue. The set even included the job center on Denmark Street, where Sue worked. As Sue has said, imagine someone playing me on Broadway. Who would have thought? And her biography on Lee Bowery has been acquired by a film production company with the intention of turning it into a film. Her portraits remain in the hands of the world's wealthiest men, tucked away in their private collections, and petitions have been started to place the works in public institutions where they can be enjoyed by all. Sue's portraits should not only be remembered for their record-breaking sales, but also for the extraordinary woman featured in them, who continues to live a thrill-filled and full life. The next time you look at Lucian Freud's Benefit Supervisor Sleeping, think of Sue Tilly of her wild years dancing her way through London's biggest nightclubs, of her friendship with the legendary Lee Bowery, and how she remained by his side through his darkest days, of the outstanding record of Lee's life that Sue wrote and got published, and of her job at the Job Center that she held through it all and worked at for over 30 years. Think of Sue's resilience, of her unique ability to remain positive and to see the glass as half full, and of her tremendous humor that has gotten her through the toughest moments of her life. Think of her continued dedication to teaching art and modeling for other artists, and of her own art, the ways in which Sue has reclaimed her own image through her varied self-portraits. But how does Sue herself want to be remembered? What does Sue want us to know about her own life when we look at Freud's portraits of her? Sue wants us to remember that her life has been a series of unplanned gifts and to always say yes to the opportunities presented to us because you never know what magic may unfold. In Sue's own words, things happen to me that I couldn't even think would happen because they're so bizarre. It's not that many people think, I want to be on a record-breaking painting, is it? I didn't think these things would happen, but then they did. And things I wanted to happen when I was young came to pass when I was older. Instead of meticulously planning her life, Sue has left things up to luck, and she couldn't be happier with how her life has turned out. Sue shares this advice. People don't let themselves have fun. People are frightened of fun. They think that something bad will happen to them, but it doesn't. You know how fantastic my life is? I've planned nothing. What I say to people is that if someone asks you to do something, then say yes, because you never know what might happen. It's better to have the experience than to not have the experience. 
everyone should just take every opportunity that comes their way. Unless it's boring, just say yes, don't think too much, don't analyze it. Mostly I just go along with things, see what happens, and look what has happened. So the message is, don't give up. When I left school, it was my dream to live like this. I waited almost 40 years and it happened. And when asked what the model brings to a work of art, Sue replied, it's all about them. They're the most important thing in the picture. I couldn't agree more. My hope is that today's episode is an important reminder of Sue's integral role in what makes Freud portraits of her some of the greatest masterpieces of our time, and that Sue is certainly the most important thing in all of her pictures. I hope you have enjoyed this episode on Sue Tilly. Be sure to listen to our bonus episode of Art Muse's official interview with Sue Tilly, who I had the pleasure of speaking with, so that you can hear from the wonderful Sue Tilly herself. I have included images, resources, and suggestions for further reading on the Art Muse website and Instagram. Art Muse is produced by Kula Production Company. Today's episode was written by me, your host, Grace Anna. Stay tuned as I continue to share the stories of the women behind some of the world's most important works of art. Until next time, bye for now.